Welcome to Hope City Church. This is a place where you don't have to have it all together. Where it's okay to not be okay. We're all in the same boat. That's why we gather every Sunday, because we believe Jesus gives us a better way to do life. This is a place where we can connect and grow in our faith, where we are challenged to not settle for complacency. Where we pursue grace and truth with a desire to become more like Jesus. Our ultimate hope is to be a place where we bump into Jesus and experience His life-changing hope. This hope changes our families. This hope changes our workplaces and cities. This hope changes you, and this hope changes me. This hope is for everyone. church family update going into 2024 with you guys. So first off, if you were around here for Christmas a couple weeks ago, man, Christmas at Hope City was just amazing. Like if you invited, if you attended, if you volunteered, man, we just want to say thank you because it was an incredible uh, weekend to celebrate Christmas. We were uh, up 43% in terms of attendance from the previous year, yeah, which is worth celebrating. Uh, but man, I just want you guys to know, uh, like Jared said, uh, they had their baby the week leading into Christmas. And so we gave Jared uh, the biggest weekend around Hope City off so that he could be with his family. And and special shout out to Noah Payden and Peggy Richmond for filling in. They did an incredible job making City Life happen. So just want to say thank you guys. Uh, On top of that, we are kicking off this new year uh, with adding two new staff members to our family here at Hope City. And I want to introduce them to you via picture here in a minute, and you'll understand why in a minute. But this is Ellen Reynolds. She's our our new City City Kids Director. And... um, Ellen is just jumping into the fire this morning. Uh, she's down there with your kids right now, so let, let just pray, okay? Uh, but man, her, her heart and passion for the next generation is just so obvious. Uh, she was our, our top choice whenever Gabe uh, accepted the position with our network family to move up to Hope City in Joplin. Uh, Ellen has been part of Hope City since before we launched, has served in almost every capacity in the kids area, and is absolutely the right person uh, to jump on the team and take on this role. So uh, please be sure if you see Ellen, stop by, say hey, give her a high five. And um, I, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. If you feel like that you want to jump in and serve with kids, Ellen could use some volunteers, all right? So hang on to that for a little bit. And then second, we brought on uh, Johnny Templeton as our engagement pastor. Yeah, Johnny and his family have been around here for like the last six months or so. And, and it, I don't know if you know this, but Hope City, uh, this church has become the church for a lot of pastors who have served in ministry at other churches before, and Johnny's one of those guys. His full-time job uh, is he's a a general manager with Schubert Mitchell uh, Homes, like a home builder here, Uh, but we were able to convince him to come on part-time for uh, a few hours a week to help us uh, just get people involved more at this church, to help you kind of take your next step here at Hope City, and then to help me out with some high-level leadership things. And Johnny had the opportunity this weekend to actually be at the church that he was on staff at up in Missouri because their lead pastor is preaching his final sermon uh, up there. So they're up there this weekend, but Johnny will be starting with us next weekend. So please be sure to say hey to Johnny, say hey to Ellen, welcome them on to the staff team. I know that they're already part of the Hope City family, but uh, man, welcome them on the team really, really well. Uh, This morning, I'm pumped because we're kicking off a brand new series called Mediocrity, right? Kind of want, want to start the new year, but by definition, mediocrity, get this, it's a state of being average, It's being ordinary or of moderate uh, quality, and it's often associated with a lack of ambition, effort, or the failure to reach a higher standard. Like, Happy New Year, right? And uh, the tagline for this that we're talking about is moving beyond me. Like, if I want to see 2024 be a different year, if I want to take steps forward in life, in relationships or finances or fitness or anything else, I have one major obstacle in my way. It's me. It's myself. And so what we're going to have to look at this year is how do we move beyond ourselves in order to see growth in our lives going into this next year? So, so by a show of hands real quick, does anybody have any like goals or resolutions going into this year? Anybody set anything out? A, a few of us. Some of us are still thinking about you're working on it, you know, but uh, maybe it's a diet or an exercise goal. Maybe you're like me and uh, the holidays hit and you're like, I don't work out anymore. I quit and I'm going to eat all the food and now it's time to get back to the gym. Uh, or maybe you're focusing on one of our values around here at Hope City. You're saying, man, I want to pursue health when it comes to like my mental health, my emotional health. I'm going to sleep more. I'm going to learn a new hobby or skill, or I'm going to go to counseling for the first time. Or maybe it's around finances or relationships. Maybe you go, man, I need to get some of these things in order. Or maybe it's a spiritual goal. Anybody hoping to grow in your faith this year? I I know I am. And one thing I know for sure is this. None of us enter 2024 
hoping for a mediocre year, right? Anybody set a goal that just says, uh, man, I just want to be mediocre in 2024, right? <laughs> like none of us. And, and so in order for that to be true, we have to take a look at some things in our lives to, to move beyond ourselves in order to see the growth that we want to have happen. And, and the first thing that we're going to talk about today that we have to move beyond is we have to learn to move beyond the chaos. We got to move beyond the chaos. And, and see, most of us, we hit the year with great intentions around our goals, but and none of us set out to fail at our goals or resolutions, but statistics show this, that by February, 80% of us will have failed at those goals or resolutions that we set. And then the majority of us will go on and settle back into the same patterns or habits of life that we had when we started the year. And none of us set out to see that happen, right? None of us want to settle for mediocrity, yet the chaos of life can hit. And then it's just kind of back to where we started. If you're parents, you know that... Um, you're coming out of a season of chaos, right? With Christmas break, we all have these plans and intentions uh, to get, have like this restful Christmas and meaningful family time. And then you introduce like actual kids into the equation and, and it becomes organized chaos at best, doesn't it? I know some of you are laughing, you know what I'm talking about. Or if you're like our family, uh, we went and visited family in Indiana and we brought home like the worst Christmas gift ever from family. We all ended up sick and then organized chaos devolved into just chaos over this past week as we tried to manage Ashley and I being sick sick and all of our kids at home still on Christmas break. And I, I think that when we pause and we think about life, some of us might describe our lives this way, right? It's organized chaos or, or it's controlled chaos or it's just straight up chaos. And the reality is the chaos can leave us living a mediocre life. It, it's, not, it, it's keeping us from hitting the target that we've intended for ourselves. See, chaos can come in the form of a phone call that comes out of nowhere, right? Or your company restructures and your position got eliminated, or the car breaks down, and the bills start to pile up, or, or the mental health stuff starts to add up, or man, maybe you actually start to break mentally because you can't keep up with the demands of school or your relationships or the expectations of your, of your spouse or your parents or your teachers, or, or maybe you're already starting to feel it this first week of the new year. The demands on your time and schedule are just stretching you so thin. Or maybe your children continue to make bad decisions, and the gap in your relationship just seems to get wider and wider. We all have these chaotic, like, life hit the fan moments, don't we? And around Hope City, we say it this way. We are all in the same boat, meaning this, that none of us is exempt from experiencing the chaos of life. Uh, think about it. If you think back to this time last year, in January of 2023, what happened in your life last year that you didn't see coming, that felt like chaos, that knocked you off track from your resolutions or goals or the life that you wanted for yourself? And when you look ahead to 2024, we realize that, like, something needs to change, right? And that's where those goals or resolutions come in for most of us. And another way to say goal or resolution or wanting to see change in our life is this. It's conviction. A conviction is like this gut-level desire to see something change. We have a conviction that if we want to see change in our lives, we have to move beyond the chaos, right, into something better. So, so how do we do that? That's a question that we want to look at today. How do we move beyond the chaos in our lives and step into a life of conviction? And so if you have your phones or Bibles today, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And 1 Samuel 14 is found in the Old Testament of your Bible. Uh, this tells the story of everything from the time the world was created up until 400 years before Jesus came on the scene. And we're going to take a look in 1 Samuel 14 um, at a king named Saul. And when Saul was the king of Israel, Israel was in absolute chaos. And here's why. Because Saul did not live a life of conviction. His life was marked by deep fear and insecurity in his leadership. He, he lacked faith and he constantly struggled to trust God's promises and obey that God asked him to do something. And Saul just didn't, didn't act on it. And the result for Saul and the nation was chaos. On top of that, the Israelites had this perpetual enemy called the Philistines. And the Philistines have set up camp in Israel, and they're just creating chaos all around them. And here's what you need to know about the Philistines. The Philistines were, were one of the strongest, most powerful, uh, most advanced nations in the world at the time. They, they were some of the first people to work with iron and, and bronze. And so they had uh, weapon systems and an army that was far superior uh, to Israel. And they controlled all the trade routes in and out of Israel. So they kept the Israelites from getting access to iron specifically. So they couldn't forge stronger weapons to fight back against the Philistines. 
And now the Philistines are gathering in Israel to fight the Israelites. And we learn that in, in 1 Samuel 13 that the, Israel, or the Philistine army was made up of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Meaning this, the army couldn't even be counted. And King Saul's army, the Israelites, they've scattered in the face of this larger Philistine army. They've gone into hiding in the mountains and the caves, and there's only 600 soldiers left that are still ready to fight with Saul. Like the, can you picture this? The nation is in chaos. Yet hundreds of years earlier, God had promised the Israelites that they would live in this land that the Philistines are occupying and that they would overcome the Philistines. They just hadn't fully believed it yet. And so the Israelites were desperate for someone who would be willing to step up and live with conviction in the face of the chaos. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in 1 Samuel 14 with Saul's son, Jonathan. Uh, 1 Samuel 14, verse 1, it says this, that one day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, which is kind of like his assistant in battle, he goes, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul, the king, Jonathan's dad, he was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. And with him were about those 600 men who hadn't scattered and went into hiding. And so while Saul's army is deserting him, he and 600 of his men are just kind of hanging out underneath a pomegranate tree while an enemy occupies their country. And his son Jonathan has a conviction that if, if someone doesn't take action, if someone doesn't step up and do something, the nation's just going to continue in chaos. So, so Jonathan goes, man, we need to move beyond this chaos that we found ourselves in. And, and despite God giving Saul a clear call to lead the nation and to begin trusting God that he would deliver the Israelites, Saul's stuck in the chaos. He's just kind of letting it happen to him. And so Jonathan jumps into action. Verse 4, it says, On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other was called Senna. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash and the other toward the south, or the other to the south toward Geba. And what this is describing is what's known in uh, Israel or other desert regions as a, a wadi. It's kind of a fun word. Uh, in, in Arkansas, we would just call it a holler, okay? It's a dry riverbed where uh, water would run, run through, and it, it stays dry for most of the year, but it actually would fill up to the top with water during flood season. In fact, this wadi, wadi suwainit, uh, you don't know how to say it either, all right? But this wadi, they believe, is, is actually the wadi that Jonathan and his armor bearer were in that day. And where the Philistines were, where they went in to this deep valley with cliffs on either side. And Jonathan says, hey, we're, we're going to go through here to get to the Philistines. This is where they went looking for the fight. Verse 6 says this, and they're in the, the base of this wadi. Can you picture it now? Jonathan goes, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men, which is like the um, Jewish equivalent of calling them a bunch of SOBs. All right, like you need to read the Bible. It's, it gets really interesting, but... Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf, Jonathan says. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Now, I want you to remember for a minute, how many Philistines are there? More than can be counted, right? And Saul and his army are scattered and paralyzed by the chaos and the insurmountable size of the Philistine army. And Jonathan has the conviction to act on the promises of God despite the circumstances. So, so when we look at the chaos of our lives, how do we move beyond the chaos into a life of conviction? Well, we have to be willing to act on the promises of God, even when the circumstances don't make sense. And Jonathan's armor bearer says this, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I'm with you, heart and soul. I mean, could you imagine standing in this valley and you know that the Philistine army is just above you, uh, just up the cliff. And he's going, go ahead. I'm with you. Just us two. I'm with you. Heart and soul. And that literally translates to this. The armor bearer is saying to Jonathan, I'm with you as your heart is with you. Jonathan's armor bearer is saying, I'm on your side and in your corner, just like your heart is beating inside your body. I'm with you and I'm not leaving. And if we're going to move from a life of chaos to conviction, then we need some friends in our corner who aren't going to leave us who are going, hey, I know you're getting ready to take this step. I know you're facing something bigger than what you know what to do with. You've got to have some people that go, I'm not leaving. I'm right here. Verse 8, Jonathan says, come on then. We'll cross over and we will let them see us, which is absolutely an absurd plan, right? Like if there's only two of us like trying to attack a, a, an army that couldn't be counted, the last thing I want is for that army to see me, right? Um, here's why this plan is so absurd. 
because it will only work if God is in it with them. And Jonathan lays out, here's how we're going to know if God is in this. Verse 9, he says, If the Philistines say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and we won't go up. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because why? That will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. See, to move from a life of chaos into a life of conviction, it's not possible by our own limited power or strength. It's only possible if the Lord is in it with us. Verse 11 tells us what happened. So both of them climbed up the cliffs out of that deep valley. Can you picture it still? And they showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, the Philistine said, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes that they were hiding in. And the men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up here and we'll teach you a lesson. And so Jonathan said to his armor bearer, this is our sign. Climb up after me because the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And so Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. And in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. And if you keep reading down in 1 Samuel chapter 14, you'll see that the conviction and the faith of Jonathan and his armor bearer to trust God to act in the middle of chaos. It actually allowed them not just to win a victory over 20 Philistines at an outpost, it actually threw the entire Philistine army into chaos and they started fighting each other, something that only God could have done. And it didn't stop there because Saul and the, the rest of the Israelite army, they entered into the fight now as well. The conviction of Jonathan and his armor bearer to go first inspired an entire army and an entire nation to trust the work of God that day. And, and here's what God did. Verse 23, it says, on that day, the Lord saved Israel. Now, when you look at the chaos of your life, if you're like me, a lot of us need an on that day, the Lord saved me moment, don't we? So what does it look like for us to move beyond the chaos of life and step into a life of conviction? Well, we've already looked at a few things that Jonathan and his armor bearer did in contrast to Saul and the rest of the army, but let's look at this again. While Saul and the rest of the army were just sitting in the mediocrity and just kind of letting the chaos happen to them, right? Jonathan and his armor bearer were willing to act on the promises of God even when it didn't make sense. And, and while Saul's army had scattered and deserted him, Jonathan had his armor bearer in his corner. He had a friend with him that said, I'm not going anywhere. If God's asking you to act, I'm on your side and we're going to do this together. But maybe the biggest underlying thing in this whole thing the, the biggest word that we could sum all this up as is that Jonathan saw the chaos of the situation. And, and in order to act in conviction, he took ownership. Jonathan took ownership of this situation. He, he didn't resign himself to the chaos. He, he didn't say, well, I'm not the king. There's nothing I can do. No, he looked at the chaos around him and he said, if someone doesn't do something, it's just going to continue to be this way. And, and so Jonathan said, man, I'm going to take ownership and I'm going to act because God is in this with us. And that's the bottom line for today. The way to move from the chaos of life and to live a life of conviction, it starts with ownership. It starts with ownership. It means taking ownership of your life so that you have the power to influence the direction you're headed. Taking ownership impacts your power to create different results in almost every aspect of your life and your relationships. Like, for example, if you want to grow in your physical health this year, you have to take ownership to get to the gym and eat right. If you want to get out of the chaos financially, you've got to take ownership and get on a budget and stick to it. If you want to see your relationships move out of chaos, you have to take ownership of those relationships and actually invest in them. Or, or you've got to take ownership and set boundaries to limit the chaos from toxic or unhealthy relationships in your life. And deep down, this is something that we know that's true, right? If we want to move beyond the chaos of our life and we actually want to live out the convictions that, that we feel are important, we have to take ownership. But, but why is it that so many of us struggle with this concept? You, you ever find yourself struggling to take ownership? You, you ever find yourself like making excuses or blaming others for the circumstances of your life? Hey, have you ever said something like this? Like, man, it, it's not my fault. If they wouldn't have done that thing to me or if that bad thing wouldn't have happened, then my life would be different. See, taking ownership means that we have to admit something's our fault. And that brings up something in us, doesn't it? See, see, most of us were not taught to associate fault with power. If something was our fault, it brought punishment 
because we did something that our parents said that we shouldn't do. And it maybe even brought up shame, right? Shame's the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love or belonging. Shame, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love or belonging. And man, that's a pretty accurate description of what it feels like if we're in trouble or something's our fault, right? And so as a result, most of us go through our lives failing to take ownership because we've been avoiding shame at all costs. And, and we just kind of let the chaos of life happen to us. But that's cost us something. The, the cost is that we've lived with very little power or effectiveness when it comes to taking ownership to move beyond the chaos and to live out a life of conviction of what we really want to see in our lives. But, but here's the secret when it comes to ownership. When it comes to ownership, it's a good thing when it's your fault. Well, let me say that again. It is a good thing when it's your fault. You want it to be your fault. Why? Because if it's your fault, you can trace it back to a decision or a choice that you've made along the way, and you now have the power and the conviction to take ownership of that choice, and now you're able to make a different choice moving forward and create different results moving into the future. And here's the key question we have to ask when it comes to taking ownership, to move beyond the chaos into a life of conviction. We have to ask this, I wonder how I'm contributing to this situation. I wonder how I'm contributing to this situation. If you look at your relationships and your relationships with your spouse or your kids or your friends aren't where you want them to be, you have to ask, what, what am I doing to contribute to this? If your finances are chaos, you have to ask, what role am I playing that's contributing to the chaos? If my mental health isn't great, I have to ask, what steps can I take in, in order to see this improve instead of allowing it to define every part of my life? When it comes to our physical health, what decisions or choices am I responsible for in getting me to the point that I am right now physically? And, and what can I do from here to take ownership and move into the future that I really want? See, taking ownership means that whenever we find chaos in our lives showing up, instead of pointing the finger at somebody else, we actually have to look in the mirror and we have to ask, man, I wonder how I'm contributing to the chaos that's showing up in my life. So back on Christmas, I shared this conviction that I have in my life that what I really want for myself, the conviction that I want, is peace. I really want all things to work together as they should in my life and my relationships. I, I want peace with God and peace with people. However, what I found is that I actually get in the way of that peace by powering up and yelling at my kids and like just trying to take control of a situation instead of coming alongside them and parenting them in a way that, that leads to peace. And here's what happens when I power up and yell. I actually contribute to the chaos in my life. I contribute to the chaos in my home and in my relationship with Ashley and our kids rather than doing the hard work of taking ownership and acting on the conviction that if I want peace, powering up and yelling is not going to get me there. See, parenting and patience and loving my kids will, well, that's what will get us there. Do you see what I mean by, about taking ownership? Does that make sense? And, and one more note that's important to distinguish on taking ownership is that taking ownership does not mean taking the blame for everything. See, on the other extreme, we could get to a place where, where we allow it to be completely our fault. We take the blame for things that we shouldn't, or, or we try to take control of everything. But so many things in life are out of our control, right? You don't control where you were born. You don't control the family you were born into or the color of your skin. You don't control the financial situation that you were born into. And an asteroid could hit the earth tomorrow, right? And that would be completely out of our control. You cannot own or take the blame for the toxic or abusive behavior of others towards you. But for the things that we do control, which let's be honest, is 99% of where the chaos that we face every day comes from, Taking ownership is absolutely the pathway to move beyond the chaos to living out the convictions that we want to see in our lives. So, so how do we do that? Well, just like in this story with Jonathan and his armor bearer, this is not possible unless the Lord is in it with us. So, so I want to close out by giving us three challenges that if you take these things and put them in, into practice on a spiritual level, you'll be on your way to taking ownership of your life and moving beyond the chaos and living a life of conviction. And the first one's this. Take, take ownership to know God's word. Spend 15 minutes a day in the Bible. Uh, one of the earliest things that Jewish rabbis would ever teach young Jewish kids is to trust the story. And, and they take them back to the very first line of the Bible in the book of, the, of Genesis. In the beginning, 
God. God's the author of life. And, and if we learn to trust his story, then maybe we can move to a place that we learn to trust God himself. And, and Jonathan knew the promises of God that he'd given. He would have heard this as a little boy growing up, trust the story. And he took ownership of those promises. He took ownership of that story, and he acted on the conviction that God would be true to his word. And, and Jesus promised us in this life, there will be trouble, right? There will be storms and chaos around us. But if we take ownership through his word and we put it into practice, Jesus promises this. We've got lives that will stand up no matter what chaos is going on around us. And if you don't know where to start, I put a couple QR codes up here on the screen. Uh, the first one for a reading plan, every week we will email out a reading plan based on our teachings in here. And so you can sign up for that at that QR code. Or, or if you don't have it, download the YouVersion Bible app. They've got reading plans on the app that you can pick one on your, you know, kind of on your own. Or they put a verse of the day in the middle of the home screen every single day. And you could read that verse and then you could kind of go through the prompts they have there. And, and you'll be on your way to spending 15 minutes a day getting to know God through his word. The, the second thing you have to take ownership of is this, a prayer. This looks like 15 minutes a day in prayer. I, I want you to put yourself in Jonathan's shoes that day. You're in this deep valley and you're getting ready to climb up a cliff to face an enemy that cannot be counted. What are you doing? You're praying, right? If you're like me, you're going, God, you better be true to your promises. I, I know what you said. I, I just, I, I'm acting on what, you, what I think that you want me to do. This better be real. And, and he even told his armor bearer what he was praying. He goes, I, I'm praying that God would deliver us. And, and in Jesus, here's what we see. The crazier and more chaotic Jesus' life got, the more he prayed. The more the crowds pressed in, the more the chaos came, the more demands he had on his time and his schedule, the more Jesus said, I got to get away from the chaos and I'm going to go spend time with my father. So here's a way to think about prayer going into this year. For just 15 minutes a day, start here. What am I thankful for? When you think about the chaos of your life, does it bring up anxiety? I mean, it's scientifically proven that gratitude and anxiety, they don't coexist in our brains, Right? So if we start with what we're thankful for, it's really hard to be anxious about the chaos when gratitude is what flows from us. And I say that as a person who like, has been diagnosed with anxiety. The next question is this, what do I need? More, more than anything else in Scripture, we're commanded to ask. And God tells us sometimes you don't have what you need because you don't ask. See, he wants to be our provider in every way, more, more than we are for ourselves. So we start with that, like, what do I need? Just ask him. And then the other question we could ask is, what do others need? And this is what Jonathan did. Think about this. How might taking ownership through prayer influence the life and faith of others, just like it did for all of Israel when Jonathan was willing to take action? So pray for other people in your life. The, the final thing is this. Take ownership of your community. Take ownership of your community. And, and what this looks like is this community. If Hope City is your church, what we are asking moving into this next year, is take ownership of this church and take ownership of what God's doing through us. Join a team. Just like Jonathan, let me ask you, do you have someone in your corner like his armor bearer who's willing to stick with you no matter what? Who's willing to be with you as you live out a life of conviction and move beyond the chaos? And if you talk to anybody here at Hope City, and I would encourage you, go ask them. The people who are serving on, on a team are not only the ones who feel the most connected to others and feel like they have people in their corner, but they're also the ones who can look back over this last year. And I'm going to put you guys on the spot. If you're a volunteer, be ready to an answer this question. They're the ones that could look back over this last year and say that they've seen their faith grow the most. Why? Because they're taking ownership of what they say they believe, and they're actually putting those convictions into practice. See, the church doesn't just exist to show up on Sunday mornings and feel better about ourselves. Like brunch and sleeping in is better than that, all right? I'm just being honest. No, the church exists to kick back against the chaos of the world. The church exists to be a light in the middle of darkness. The church exists, exists to bring hope and healing to the brokenness. Not just to point to Jesus, but to tangibly live out his life in the middle of a world that is desperate for hope so that the world would look at us and go, that's what I want. That's what this is supposed to look like. And, and, and right now, Hope City, um, we've got a need for people to jump on our team. Like if this is your church, it's time to step up and take ownership. In City Kids, Ellen needs six volunteers who would be willing to jump in 
and help kids know that God loves them, that he created them, and he created them on purpose and for a purpose. And if you're a parent, here's what you need to know. Your kids are being discipled every single day. They're being taught in the way of chaos every single day, through school, through friends, through phones, through YouTube, through whatever else. The question is, are we willing to take ownership of their lives and point them to something real and true that moves them beyond the chaos to a life of conviction? And if we won't, who will? And so if you're sitting in here today and you're like, man, I want to take an active role in taking ownership of the next generation who call Hope City their church, fill out your Connect card. Jump in and start serving and start shaping the future. Take ownership. Uh, we've got a need for eight volunteers on our City Life team. Um, so many people who come into Hope City for the first time, they describe it this way to me. They say, this is like a refuge from the storm. They, this feels like peace in the middle of chaos. And, and you know where that starts? It starts with someone in the parking lot or at the front door just smiling and holding the door open. It starts with a cup of coffee when you come in here. It, it starts with somebody on our prayer team saying, hey, I know what you got going on is chaos. I'm in your corner. I'm going to pray for you. Be part of helping people experience that. Take ownership of it. And then our worship life team has a need for four volunteers total, two to help load in in the mornings and two to, to just take pictures, do photography. Our, our load-in team literally takes ownership of this building to create an environment where people walk in here and you get to experience Jesus' work. I mean, think about that. And, and it's just by getting here and helping load stuff in and set it up. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a little biased towards our load-in team, but they're the most fun team here at Hope City, all right? So if you want to have fun, jump in with us early. And then our creative team, Jason Miller was telling us, man, we've got a need for, for two people that can just do photography or videography to help capture pictures of the work that God is doing in and through this church. See, most people who come here for the first time, and, and this may be some of your story, um, you found us online, didn't you? Or, or maybe you heard about us, but you went to our website or you went to our, our Facebook or Instagram and you wanted to know if you were walking into a cult, right? And you're like, I just want to see, are these people normal and will I fit in here? When you take pictures of what happens here and when you join a team that's helping put digital content out, you are telling the story of what God's doing through Hope City. And you're creating a first impression of what, what's happening here before people even walk through these doors. And so I want to challenge you today. If, you're, if, if this is your church, if Hope City is your church, and we're a brand new church, meaning like if you've been here more than two times, that qualifies you as like you came back, right? <laughs> you got to take ownership of this community. You have to jump in and be part of what God's doing here. You got to serve. And, and that's how we start to step out of a life of chaos into a life of conviction is by taking ownership, not just of our own lives spiritually, but of the community that God has entrusted us with. This community right here spiritually. And so I want to leave off with this question. Just like Jonathan's willingness to take ownership, to move beyond the chaos, and to live a life of conviction, who or what hangs in the balance of your decision to take ownership moving into this next year? Uh, I'll tell you, it starts with you, because you are the only one that can take ownership of your decisions moving forward. And then it moves on to the people closest to you. It, it, it's your family. It's your spouse. It's your kids. It's your friends. It's your coworkers. It literally is the next generation downstairs and in our community. Uh, see, I think Hope City, God is desperate for people that are willing to lean in and trust him at his promises, even when it doesn't make sense. Who are willing to act on the conviction that he is who he says he is, and that he will do everything that he promised to do in this life. And as we lean into that, not only do we get to experience the hope of Jesus for our lives and he changes us, but I think that we're going to see a community and a generation start to experience the hope that they're dying for. Again, if we don't, who will? And I, I want to be part of a church that, that, that takes ownership of our faith. I, I want to be part of a community that says, man, look, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you, where you've been or what you've done, what's been done to you, no matter what you believe right now, when you come in here, this is a refuge from the chaos. This is a place of hope and peace and healing. And guess how God's going to bring that about? Through you and me. He, he wants to work in our lives and through us to help our friends and family and our community experience that. And it only happens if we take ownership of it. That's the community I want to be part of. Now, who's with me? We're going to move into our time of prayer. And uh, this is a time that we pause every week to remember that Jesus, he moved into our chaos. He took ownership of all the crap that we've ever done. He took it on himself through the cross. 
died a death that he didn't deserve so that we could be reconnected back to God and we could live a life of conviction. That's worth taking a hold of. That's worth taking ownership of. So let's step into this next year and go, Jesus, I'm trusting you. No matter what's coming this year, no matter what I can't see, I know that you're going to move me to a life of conviction, no matter the chaos around me. So in this time, just ask him what your next step is. Ask him what he's asking you to do. This is time to pause and just connect with Jesus in that way. Let me pray for us. Then these next few minutes are yours. So Jesus, you're really good. And um, man, thank you for um, offering us a, a whole new life, um, for, for getting into our mess and chaos, to bring healing and hope and peace. And um, Jesus, this idea around ownership can be really hard because it brings up a lot. And it's, it, it, it's just hard. Um, but you promise us, Jesus, that we don't walk through this life alone. When our faith is in you, your spirit's inside us, and you promise the same power that rose you from the dead is living in us. So give us the power and the strength and the courage to take a step this year, to take ownership of our lives, our faith, and our community. And Jesus, would you just be glorified through that? Would you allow people to see who you are and what you're like through us? We're saying we'll go first. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.